Yeah, I'm Paul Thornton. Some of you know me as breaker of internets and stroker of cats. Um, this is sort of an interesting uh, historical meander, um, for want of a better word, around the sort of 1996-1997 uh, period. It was going to be a bit more than that. Um, but when I got to about 60 slides, I thought I'm going to have to cut this down and chop it into a few different presentations. And there's also an awful lot to go through. So I, I think I'm probably going to be around the 700 millicurtis rate of presentation delivery. So I do apologize for that. See if this works. So uh, just to go back a little bit in time, how on earth did I end up uh, doing this stuff? Well, frankly, it's all Acorns for, and you can blame uh, a 1980s computer manufacturer for a lot of things. Um, I ended up, after messing around with BBC Micros in, uh, at school and things, working for the company that made a lot of the file servers for Acorn Networks in those days, SJ Research. They went on and did some pretty funky stuff in Cambridge with uh, interactive TV trials, uh, doing things like... Um, X over E1s over funky strange ATMness that was uh, way ahead of its time. Um, and unfortunately, they went bust. Well, you know, it's a recurring theme in this industry. And um, yeah, I needed something else to do, so I went off and uh, worked for PSINet. But just to go back slightly further still, IP. Well, yeah, in my second year of university, um, they were really, really rude, and it all went from X25 to IP. And I just managed to cope with these um, pad things and all the other bizarreness that uh, we did back then. And, um, I, I, yeah, I kept this strange link to the past, though. I had this very odd X400-based email address at the time run by a sister company of SJs. They had a bank of modems that uh, dialed people up overnight, mainly schools, to collect and deliver mail. Um, I discovered something else when doing this, and that was that to get between all of these completely incompatible systems, UUCP, X400, there were Janet mails, internet addresses, and they're all trying to talk to each other. But what you could do is you could stick at mhsrelay.ac.uk or at uk.ac.mhsrelay, depending on uh, which way round your uh, local MTA preferred its ends, and it would sort it out for you most of the time. If it didn't, you generally got a superb bounce message back that was a work of art. The only real problem was you had really, really messy, ugly headers that looked something like that. And uh, when I pasted this page in, PowerPoint attempted to hyperlink those X400 addresses, which I thought was spectacularly optimistic of it. And uh, the observant will among, amongst you will note that those um, two dates in May 1993 go back in time, so something had a lying time zone. However, without further ado, um, yeah, AS1290, the old EUNet, um, GBAS, taken over by PSINet uh, in 1995, early 96. And yeah, everything was a bit different, but also strangely similar. So what, what were we actually doing back then? Well, I can't find a price list. I did look. Uh, but there was an old UK.net fact entry for January 1996 that says, we offer UUCP, full IP, I'm not quite sure what half IP was, a mail feed, news feed, ISDN, slip, remember slip people, PPP, lease line, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, history doesn't recall whether you could purchase full IP over UUCP, but I'm sure a salesman did try to sell it at some stage to someone. And how did we deliver these? Well, um, UUCP, slip, PPP, things that involved a modem, there was a stack of old courier modems, some of you will probably remember them as well, all with their individual brick power supplies, perched precariously on racking, not necessarily a 19-inch rack, in a pop, connected to one of these lovely pieces of equipment. Uh, and I no longer have one of these, and my life is enriched. Uh, so this was a net blazer. It did many things, um, generally not very well, but terminating dial-up connections was one of them. Uh, what did customers have? Uh, typically, they didn't have any CPE for this product. Uh, they had a Unix machine or they had a Windows machine. Some very, very rare uh, people had routers, but it didn't happen very often. This was normally due to the cost of this, um, you know, having a router on your LAN. Normally, you just had a, um, a PC that shared the internet connection. Uh, now, some uh, very uh, inspired people used local ca uh, cable companies, Centrex lines with 33K6 modems to have a permanent always on connection to the internet, and this is what we did at home. We had a FreeBSD 2.1 box that acted both as a router and a mail gateway, and it had a snake of 10 base 2 ethernet going around the house. It was as unreliable as sin, but hey, this was you know the pinnacle of geekdom in Cambridge in 1996, was to have a LAN with always on internet connectivity. It helped that you worked for your ISP at the time. 
Um, ISDN, yeah, how did they do that? Well, we had a couple of uh, Cisco 2503s normally with normal BRI lines. These weren't E1s, this was all just individually done. And at the customer's end, they had an ISDN TA, much like they might have a modem, plugged into a PC or a, uh, a Unix box. Some brave souls used to send Pipeline 25 routers. They had an enjoyable time. <laughs> they, um, yeah, they, they, they sort of worked. Uh, there was a particularly lovely ISDN product that EUNet offered that involved a box down in the POP in Canterbury that bridged ISDN directly onto the POP Ethernet. Yeah, that was as bad as it sounds. And there was very little debugging in this thing. It was notoriously hard to troubleshoot. You just had to reboot and hope. And when it got down to um, the last few customers on this, because we could see that they had MAC addresses there, but we didn't know who they were, uh, we decided, well, we just better turn this off and see who rings up and complains. And nobody did, so they clearly weren't being billed for that service. And, and, and when this thing came back to Cambridge, it, it sat in the corridor between network operations and customer support with a large sign saying, kick me on it, and both departments um, enthusiastically obliged. At least lines. Right, yeah. So older pops had a Cisco AGS. Uh, that is a Cisco AGS. It's quite a superb great beast. Uh, that's actually Canterbury 1, if you can't read the label. Uh, it's um, on the back of there, there are four different physical types of serial port, and that's not even counting the console, so count that and you get five. Uh, yeah, there's about 20 odd um, X21 connections there. Each one of those would go via a BT NTU. If we were very organized, it would have a shelf, but frequently not, uh, out to a customer. And uh, I did attempt to power this machine up, having tested its power supply to see if we could get a config out of it, but it made a nasty noise, smelt of burning, and nothing came on the console, so we turned it off a bit quick. That's actually a mocking. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a particularly um, soft spot for this router in my heart because it led to my largest ever on-call claim at PSINet when it went wrong on an, over an Easter weekend. Uh, so newer pops, this was a new pop, it had a stack of Cisco 2500s, um, which all had a snake of 10 base 2 up the back, and they'd have a customer in each of their serial ports. And those of you with keen eyesight will note that the mid middle one is a 2503, so it probably had a handful of uh, ISDN customers dialing it as well. At the customer end, yeah, they had an ancient Cisco 2500 router and a equally ancient uh, BTNTE. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. So we'll sort it out later now. Um, and actually, that, that was still in use in early 2000s. This actually came from a live customer. It was one of um, my now customers' uh, internet connections. And moving on from access to hosting. Yeah, well, web hosting was troublesome as well because host headers weren't really around. And it was one IP per um, website if you wanted your own domain. So you had an awful lot of servers with an awful lot of secondary IP addresses and an awful lot of problems that that brought with them for free. Apache was pretty much bleeding edge. PSI didn't do anything that was bleeding edge. So we were still stuck with the, the ancient uh, NCSA server. So where did this network go? Well, sadly, we don't have a map from 1995, but there's a list of pop locations there and a whopping great 384k line back to um, EUNet in Amsterdam for international connectivity before PSINet added theirs. When I say POPs, EUNet's POPs fell into three main categories. There was the office down uh, Whitstable, there was some pretty precarious racks in TFM2, and anybody who visited P uh, TFM2 in those days will know the two racks I'm talking about. <laughs> And yeah, well, you just chucked a rack in the back room of a compliant customer, and yeah, that became the pop. And um, I was reminded when I wrote this that it didn't actually have, have to be faster than 64K. So there were some poor customers that had a 64K lease line with another sort of five or six 64K lease lines off the back of them. The new, this was, was cutting edge, this was. Uh, so PSINet turned up and went, well, what are we going to do with this? And we need to migrate it all over to our new frame relay network. And one thing that stuck with me, which is sort of come full circle, is having an underlying layer two network. And when you've got an underlying layer two network, you can do loads of clever stuff logically on your layer three network. 
Uh, lots of people did not do this at the time. It was all just routers connected to routers. And PSI net salespeople milked this for all it was worth because we could build a PVC that missed out all these nasty trace route hops. And for some reason in 1996, customers were obsessed with trace route hops, um, probably because they added about 10 milliseconds each time it went through a router. But um, yeah, we, we could uh, pull stunts like, Bill, you want a PVC to there? We can do that. Uh, and, and they also collapsed the pops. There were sort of three main pops. Um, Dial-up and PSTN and ISDN, some will remember those racks in Energis where you had this marvellous 0845 dial-in that just delivered to a bunch of E1s all in one place. This was magic. Um, unfortunately, the Ascend Maxes we used to terminate them were the most awkward beasts. I should be polite to them and call them that. And migrating ISDN customers was a real pain because ISDN customers managed all sorts of cleverness, which generally involved a visit to them just to get them off the old network onto the new network. Um, the other thing that was going on here, of course, was loads of competing standards for what was going to be faster than 33.6K. And none of the modem manufacturers could really make their minds up, so PSI Net, not wanting to back the wrong horse, didn't actually get any for ages. So all of our customers were stuck down at uh, slow rate. Uh, lease line customers, yeah, well, they got uh, brought to the nearest physical pop, which might not, of course, have been logically the closest one for them. They were all frame relay. The old Cascade 9000 switches, they were battle cruisers. Uh, 64k customers came in on um, E1 bearers from BT. Uh, unfortunately, BT wouldn't do that for 128 to 512k customers, so they had to come in on a separate connection, and two megs were an E1 directly. Uh, these pops basically had two main ingredients. It was a frame relay switch and a Cisco 7507. They were interconnected with hissy cables, normally just the one, because I, I can remember that our telehouse pop by about 2000 definitely had multiple switches and routers. The Cambridge pop, I think, only had one switch and one router. But actually, those Ascend 9000 switches were pretty reliable when they were going. Um, anybody um, who is too young to remember, HISI stands for High Speed Serial Interface. And back then, 45 meg was rockingly high speed. And they came with a uh, equivalent price tag of sort of 100 gig port a few years ago. Uh, on the um, config of these, uh, CPE router, very similar to the previous picture a few frames ago, um, Cisco 2501, BTNTU, PVC was built, this was cutting edge, from the customer router to the pop router's hissy port, and it appeared um, to us as a time slot on an E1 bearer. Um, What's interesting there is the, the important job of keeping the DLCI number, so that's like the VLAN tag or the pseudo wire ID these days for the PVCs, unique, was entrusted to a text file on a, uh, a, a Solaris machine in the office that was under SCCS source control called fr-bible.txt. And woe betide you if you uh, mucked up the entries in that. And um, a slightly amusing anecdote is that these were all named as well. So, for example, uh, EUNET-Chadwick was the historical Chadwick Healy EUNET customer. Um, and, you know, so that you could look through and make some uh, vague association between name and customer. Uh, unfortunately, time, do time and history doesn't tell us why EUNET-Bagpus was WS Atkins in London, but I'm sure somebody somewhere knows. I don't know how I still know that, but that's probably my strange warp brain. The biggest problem with BT only giving you 31 customers on an E1 was pops that looked like that. Now, to be fair, that was slightly later. That's um, the infamous DFM4 suite in Telehouse of PSI Nets um, in about 1999. And each one of those white cables is one half of an E1. So uh, doing anything in that pop was quite hazardous. And we were so, so happy when we could get uh, better aggregates. The layer three routing between the pop router of the customers and our customer router was RIP version one, which worked surprisingly well. You know, it, it, let's give it credit where it's due. It could manage one prefix in one direction and a default in the other. This, this was OK. Um, not statically routing customers was one of those things that right now seems like the right thing to do and is really obvious. But back then, everybody else pretty much just nailed up a static. Um, the, uh, the, the only slight problem we had was when we migrated to RIP2, uh, when we sort of went classless in late 96, because up till that point, pretty much everybody got an old class C, so a slash 24, because that's what everybody did. I think there were some elderly customers who had a class B or a slash 16, and I know there was at least one ISDN dial-up customer that had a slash 16. 
And I know that because I was trying to work out in 2001 the best way to misappropriate it. And I wish I had now at $10 per address. But being, being a good, ripe citizen, I wouldn't dream of such things, just in case they're watching. And it was a great idea to have layer two PVCs from the customer pop router to um, the uh, uh, PSI net pop, but they were kind of nailed up statically. So they wouldn't flip over to another router, even if there'd been another router in the pop for them to flip over to. And I, I don't really recall in those days any customers multi-homing like we might consider it today. So two lease lines or a lease line with uh, FTTC backup or something like that. Uh, everybody was happy just to have one working connection, frankly. What we did do that was quite interesting is for Manchester, Edinburgh, and Birmingham, we had virtual pops. So the lease lines landed in Cambridge, but the PVCs went onto their own routers. These were 2501s as well. And they were connected by a two meg link to the switch, so which meant that basically when it became viable and cheaper to move all of this to a real pop, that uh, two meg X21K became a lease line and the whole lot went up to the city in question and BT did a lot of AN shifts for us. Yeah, I learned some interesting things the hard way here. If you type debug all <laughs> on a 7507 that's doing quite a lot, it, um, yeah, it, 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 it amuses uh, you, your staff, and the router. The good thing was the iOS was so rough that typing that basically crashed it and rebooted it. So 10 minutes later, normal service was restored. But that was more by luck than uh, judgment or sound engineering. But I didn't really know what I wanted to debug back then. I was green and wet behind the ears, and all seemed to catch everything. Uh, having multiple IGPs with lots of redistribution between them, especially without route maps, really can liven up uh, your life. Uh, we had RIP, obviously, from the customers, but we had IGRP going on uh, between the routers. And there was also quite a lot of routes being carried in BGP that you wouldn't necessarily have done that way uh, today either. And customers definitely don't tell the truth, especially when they're fiddling around with their own ACLs, block RIP, and therefore cut themselves off. And they can't even email you their router config, so they've got to fax it to you. There were two things that I'm really glad I bore no responsibility for. Um, the, the old 384K circuit to Amsterdam was shut down because, uh, well, it was no longer needed. Unfortunately, there was an ISDN dial backup. Some will remember that you could, you could dial a triple zero international prefix to get an uncompressed 64K channel. With six of those up for the best part of a month, it clocks up quite a bill. I don't actually know what the figure was, but it wasn't my fault. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the other one was, um, uh, some people in here will recognize that machine, strand.britain.eu.net was the precursor to ns0.nic.uk. It was the authoritative primary name server for co-UK. Unfortunately, var named decided to wander off uh, without a decent backup. And we started the FSCK minus Y at about 2 o'clock, and I remember us all going out for dinner at about 7, and it hadn't finished. So who knows how many domains went into the bit bucket that afternoon. But nobody seemed to complain, and we carried on as normal the next day. You could get away with quite a lot back then. SLAs weren't, weren't what they are today. The, um, the various EUNet service machines were basically all cross-mounted to each other with NFS. So you'd like change directory down three hierarchies you know, on the Unix file system, and you'd change machine three times. If one of them failed or just had a go slow, that was it. The whole thing just ground to a tar-pitted halt. I'm never quite sure how they bootstrapped that to bring them back up again, but clearly they managed. We were very happy that services were going off those boxes. There were other internal challenges as well. Uh, PSINet in the US had, um, had their own unique ideas about a lot of things. Uh, we weren't allowed to use anything new if it hadn't been certified. That sounds really sane, actually, you know, good idea. The certification process, though, tended to involve something at least three revisions too old and took the best part of a year. The good news was we made a profit in the UK, probably because we didn't go out and buy loads of hardware every time somebody suggested it might be a good idea, which meant that we would politely remind them of that when they demanded we did something, and um, yeah, we got away with it. And there were also routing problems because, as I say, AS174 has been the go-to AS for peering spats for a lot, lot longer than its current owner has had it. <laughs> so EUNet's network, uh, PSINet's network, uh, late, late 96, most key pops were 64K, 512K. These are whoppingly fast bandwidths, folks. Uh, there were two T1s to the States, plus 10 meg borrowed from Demon. There was a 1 meg link to Amsterdam and two links connections at 10 meg each. The 10 meg from Demon's worth more of a mention because they bought a T3 across the States, but unfortunately Cliff had nowhere to land that, so um, PSI said yeah, you can plug it into our New York pop if we can have some of the bandwidth on it. 
Now, initially, this worked really well, but then there was some kit changed at both ends, and it changed to a GRE tunnel, which meant we had MTU problems for about the next two years. I wasn't responsible for that decision either. Oh, was it only half duplex? Yeah. Oh, 10 meg half duplex, folks. <laughs> this was quick. But it was still better than the T1s we had. Um, there's actually the, there's a link at the end with a newer version of that, with, with a better picture, version of that picture, but that shows a bunch of pops link, linked together. They even got the BT circuit references. And, um, yeah, here's the, um, here's the telehouse pop in 1996. There's some routers that are missing there. There wasn't just a 1 and a 14. There was probably a 2 to N, where 2 to N were 2501s with customers on them. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to work, because this is meant to be animated. But, yes. So you might be thinking, telehouse 1, that sounds like a really important router. It was a 2514. Now, to be fair, I don't think it stayed a 2514 for long, but um, there, was a, there was a big debate going on about whether that was possible, and um, we worked out the size of the Lynx routing table at the time. It probably was. DNS, talked about that. I'm going to have to go a bit faster, probably up to about 800 millicurtises now. Uh, we inherited the primary DNS for CoUK. Um, I'm sure we would never have just added zones to the name servers. That would have been very naughty. I didn't have root on it, so it wasn't me. I definitely didn't. An awful lot of co-UK domains were submitted to the naming committee the afternoon Nominet took over, because when it got to midnight, there was no time left to reject them, so they just all went through automatically. And um, there was an infamous occasion that I now don't have time to talk about, but it's in the notes if somebody downloads this, uh, where we uh, had to get Nominet to reload all UK in the middle of the working day to avoid me being bollocked by a senior VP of PSINet. You could do that sort of thing in 1997 as well. Usenet News. Yeah, that was good, wasn't it? Um, so customers would have their 64K lease line and go, hey, we want a full news feed, and they would have that sync overnight. Unfortunately, what this did to the poor sod who was on call was generate enough packet loss on their lease line that it paged them. And um, when the um, moving news servers down to Telehouse could be hazardous as well, when the Ring of Steel was um, up due to the bombings, uh, myself and a colleague were taking news servers down to London. We were stopped by the police late at night, and I opened the boot of the car and said, it's okay, it's some servers being moved, and suddenly thought, Shit, these are news servers. Goodness knows how many dubiously legal photos there are on those. And I was very glad that the police let us go quickly without further inspection. And yeah, servers were a problem too because we were using Solaris by then, but a lot of the unit machines were Sonos. Yeah, no shadow password file, no security defaults, SSH was still being written, TCP wrappers were as good as it got, and yeah, far hardware firewalls were just coming out with the picks. However, botnets weren't around then either, so it was kind of 50-50. There was some automation, but it was all stored in text files. It was written in Sed and Orc and a bit of Perl here and there. UUCP was used to distribute configs around to service machines. It all seems rather quaint now, but you know the, the right ideas we're still doing now, we, ha we had actually started doing then. So there were a couple of funny outages. Our Lechwork pop got stolen once, um, and uh, yeah, that, that's a good reason for an outage. Um, and we'd had a number of power cuts in Cambridge, so at great expense they um, set aside some room for a generator. Then the next power outage that happened, it blew up the POP UPS. Um, so the generator started, but the power still didn't make it through. Remember, if you have an A and B power feed, folks, one of them going into just a socket on the wall is probably better than them both going into the same UPS. And after that, they upgraded all the HV power, and um, yeah, it was rock solid. So that was a good investment as well, wasn't it? Finally. I'd just like to point out that I did not write this bit of the router config in question, and the description stoat is absolutely nothing to do with me. Do we have um, any questions? Or have I stunned you all into submission? Or have you all eaten too much sticky toffee pudding to care? This is good. I'm not going to be grilled on it. Oh, no, no. Of all the things. He wants... It's because I've got that NTU, isn't it? No, no, no. I, I, um, I, actually, I think Paul... What Paul doesn't um, represent well here, and some of you will remember, was the state of the PSI TFM2 um, floor. The old EU net one. Yeah, you or, couldn't or actually... One. You couldn't actually... So Colt had a thing opposite, which was pristinely cable-tied, and I was like, wow. When I started at Colt, I was like, Wow. And, and you couldn't actually walk from one of the switches to the other switch without kind of somehow 
capturing yourself in a net. There is actually another. It, it, it is, it is, uh, I, so many times I wish I could have taken a picture of that and didn't. Well, there is a picture. That, unbelievable. That, that picture that, I, that, that is in the presentation, there's one taken from a slightly different angle, which does show this interesting great loop of cabling that you could. Great, great cascade of cable going from one rack to another, yes. <laughs> Elephant's oh, leg great. is the word you're looking for, I think. Um, the other thing about that, it, I mean, I don't know how many people here have actually been in Telehouse. Raise your hands if you've been in Telehouse. That's <laughs> quite a good, excellent, yeah, good. I know it's a room full of network engineers, but I thought I'd better check. Um, it can raise its paw. <laughs> that bit around that rack in TFM2, the floor tiles, because of the fact that whenever you ordered a circuit, a man came with a bunch of with a pair of 3002 cables and terminated them and put them in. And, and then you ordered some more, you ordered another circuit, and they said, oh, yeah, we, we can't use the other time slots on that cable you've already had put in because the, we need to feed you out of a different muck, so we're going to send you some more cable. So a man comes with another bundle of 3002 cable, and what he does, he doesn't come with just a pair this time, he comes with a big eight-core thing that's like that. And so you get loads and loads of these, and that floor outside of there, it was like being in the fun house at an amusement park. The floor tiles, it was like you trod on them, they'd try and tip you over, because they weren't actually re the floor wasn't actually resting on the feet anymore, it was resting on the mass of cables. Uh, it's amazing that we didn't have huger outages. I, I, I thought, was it, wasn't it Jerry Riley who went underneath, lit, slept under a floor tile once in Telehouse? <laughs> Yes. If you were going to do it all again, what is the one thing you would do differently? Ooh. Uh, take up beekeeping, I think. <laughs> um, I think it's do, do try and do things properly the first time. Knowing when to go, we need to do this quickly to get it out the door, and when to spend weeks doing it properly, and where you need to be on that continuum is actually one of the key skills anybody in this industry can have because sometimes we have to do things quickly we have to put in a known rush job but other times you just know that's going to come and bite you and the the, the thing that makes all this possible you know, be able to have a good laugh about this is back then it you know people were really really understanding if their lease line went down that they were paying i don't know, i mean neil probably knows this how much a 64k cost back then but yeah it, it was it was not cheap for what for what people were you know getting and but they, they were so, so tolerant if it went down for a few hours at a time. Nowadays, of course, everybody's using the internet for critical stuff, or they at least seem to think so, that being on Facebook is a critical um, thing that requires an SLA. Uh, you can't get away with that. So in some ways, the people who are doing this now just do not have the chances that people like I had to really badly screw up and that we can now laugh over now it's it's far more serious and 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 you there's no real room for error which i think is a bit of a shame but you know let's not repeat the problems of the past is the key thing okay thank you very much thanks